Good morning. Good morning to you all this Sunday morning, and good morning to our online community. Today's call of worship is found in the second book of Samuel 22, verses 2 through 3, and then we're going to skip to 32, 47, and 50. It says this, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. Verse 32 says, for who is God besides the Lord and who is the rock except our God? 47 says, the Lord lives, praise be to my rock, exalted be my rock, the rock, my, sal- my savior. And therefore I will praise you, Lord, among the nations, I will sing the praises of your name. Let us stand and worship in celebration of our Lord in whom we serve our firm foundation that is found in Christ alone. and honor to the Father, laud and honor to the Son, laud and honor to the Holy Spirit. Lord, it is in the name of the triune God that we have come to worship and adore you this morning. Lord, this day has been set apart by you, for you, so that the people of God can gather together in community, set apart by the righteousness of Jesus Christ to celebrate that 2,000 years ago, You rose from the dead for our justification. So may we enjoy that justification, the the reality of the good news that we are saved and set apart for your glory and for your honor. Spirit of the living God, would you descend upon us, the people of God, so that we might see you high and lifted up 
so that our weary souls might be nourished by the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name, the name of the one who taught his own when they prayed to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. becoming a regular occurrence around here as we are once again celebrating another covenant baptism. The reason we call it covenant baptism and not just infant baptism is we believe first and foremost about the covenant that God establishes with his people. In the book of Genesis, God established a covenant with Abraham and the covenant was a promise. It was a binding promise initiated by God to Abraham, but not only to Abraham, but to Abraham's family, that God would be the covenant God, not only to Abraham, but to his children and to his children's children. And so in obedience to God all throughout the Old Testament, the people of God would receive the sign of the covenant, but also their children would be recipients of the covenant promise as well. When we get to the New Testament, that promise continues. Although the 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 sign of the covenant changes from circumcision to baptism, the recipient does not. The sign of the covenant is still given to believers, but also to children of believers. In fact, Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 2 says, this promise is for you and for your children's children and for all who are afar off. Well, this morning we have the privilege of celebrating covenant baptism along with the Wilson family. So I'd like to invite the Wilson family to join me on stage, in particular, Erica and Jessica Wilson. Would you join me on the center step here on the chancel? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Aria Michelle Wilson, child of the covenant. And we're grateful to be, you can come on down, Jacques. Jacques Slocum as well is going to be joining me up here. For He is the grandfather of this precious covenant child father of Jessica, uh, and also a ruling elder in our denomination, the PCA. Eric and Jessica, you've heard these vows recited by many others in this church, and now you have the opportunity, standing before your family, standing before God, and standing before your church family, to answer these questions on behalf of Aria Michelle Wilson. Eric, Jessica, do you acknowledge your child's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your very own, do you? And do you now unreservedly dedicate this child and promise in humble reliance upon God's divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you'll pray with her and for her, that you'll teach her the doctrines of the holy religion, Christianity, and that you'll strive by all the means of God's appointment to raise her up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, do you? If you call Coal Ridge Presbyterian Church your church home, then you are participating today in this covenant baptism. And you, I ask you, as a member of Coal Ridge, Do you endeavor to walk alongside of this precious covenant family, pointing them to Jesus, encouraging them in the precious calling of raising up Ari and Michelle Wilson in the fear and admonition of the Lord, do you? Aria, Michelle, Wilson. That's just child of the covenant. Yes, there's mom and dad. There's your grandparents. There's your grandpa. I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. And I baptize you.
you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, covenant God, what a great reminder this morning that you build your church. What a great reminder that the God who makes promises keeps promises. What a great reminder this morning that you are faithful from generation to generation. And Lord, this is a living testimony before us that you, your promise remains, that you would, the promise you established in these two covenant homes decades ago is now coming to fruition this morning. Lord, we lift up Ari and Michelle Wilson to you, knowing that you have brought her into this covenant home. She could have been born into any home, but she was born into this home. So she is a child that is set apart and receiving the sacrament of baptism as a sign that she has been set apart, recipient of, of, of your special grace, that she would grow up in a home, that she would hear about Jesus, growing up in a home, that she would hear her parents talk about the word of God. And so I pray that through, Lord, the instruction she receives at home, the instruction she receives at this church, that she would grow up that you would save this precious child and that she would grow up to be a young woman who loves the kingdom of God more than anything else in this world. That's our prayer this morning. Give Eric and Jessica strength, wisdom, not confidence in their own ability, not confidence in their own parenting skills, but confidence that only comes in Jesus Christ. This is our prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing over this precious covenant child. Michelle Wilson to the family of God. Which one for you? And now, as we continue in a spirit of worship, I'd like to invite is Rachel here? Yeah, Rachel, come on down. Uh, so, as we prepare for the ministry of music, uh, I just want to say a brief word about this young lady. Rachel graduated from Westminster Academy uh, just a few months ago. And this will be the last time, not the final, final time, because I anticipate you being back, (laughs) expect you to be back, but the final time that she sings before she goes away to college. And so we are, uh, have been blessed by her ministry of music and will be blessed, I know, by your ministry of music this morning. Be and care. 
And isn't that it? The amazing love that we can stand on, the affirmation and the foundation of Christ alone. Let us now stand and recite this Apostles' Creed that we all believe. So when Christians, when asked the questions, why you believe why you, what you believe, what will you say? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. couple announcements for you this morning. Uh, first, you'll notice on the back of your bulletin two reminders. Uh, one actually is an announcement for the first time uh, publicly, but we are excited to have here at Coral Ridge Eric Metaxas on Wednesday night, September the 8th. Uh, Eric is coming out with a new book called Is Atheism Dead? And he will be uh, speaking on the issue of atheism, the issue of our faith and confidence in Jesus Christ, particularly in this cultural moment. So that will be September 8th, 6.30 p.m., right here in the Sanctuary of Coral Ridge. Uh, you can register for that event at crpc.org forward slash Metaxas. Also, we continue. There's only two more weeks, I believe, of Ask the Pastor, our summer virtual midweek series where we've been covering a number of topics and receiving questions from you, the congregation. This week, our Director of Christian Education will be tackling the topic of predestination. And so 6.30 p.m. Wednesday night, crpc.org forward slash midweek. You'll make sh want to make sure that you tune in for that topic this week, and you can catch all of the previous uh, Ask the Pastor classes are all archived on that site as well. Well, I wanted to give you a brief update this morning uh, on our international missions, uh, particularly our outreach in Cuba and in Haiti. A uh, couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, because as you know, uh, there's been a lot of turmoil in those two nations, in particular uh, the last few weeks. So I want to give you a brief update on what we know uh, through our ministry contacts, through our members, what's going on and what the latest is in Cuba and Haiti. And also uh, give you an opportunity to celebrate along with us uh, the work that God continues to do through this church uh, through you and your generous support in allowing the kingdom of God to be advanced in those two areas of the world in particular. Well, let me start off with uh, just a brief update concerning Cuba and Haiti. As you know, it was a matter of days uh, in between July 7th and July 11th uh, that, one, uh, Cuba experienced protest unlike they had seen in 62 years uh, the oppression of being under the communist regime for 62 years. And people came to the streets, particularly in Havana. And uh, we saw uh, people rise up, see people, people protest the communist government. Uh, and quickly, uh, the government moved to shut off communication, uh, particularly in the area of internet. 
Well, we have our pastoral contact down there is Pastor Ramon and his wife Kenya. And through the leadership and support of our church members, Jerry and Donna Perez, Jerry is a um, an elder here at Coral Ridge, but also instrumental, he and Donna, in connecting Coral Ridge with uh, Pastor Ramon and our church plant in Cuba. They have been in contact regularly. And Pastor Ramon, who lives in Havana, his message to you, the church, particularly Coral Ridge, is one thank you for your continued prayers and support uh, for the ministry that exists in Cuba. And also, he is confident that God is in this. He believes this latest, um, this latest measure, this latest uh, protest, that God is in this, and he is praying, and he wants us to join him in prayer, and praying that this might be the very beginning of the end that we've been waiting for, that God would use this uh, latest political situation to bring about revival in that nation. So he covets your prayers and asks for continued to prayer for he, for his wife Kenya, and for the people of Cuba. Regarding Haiti, our ministry there, we are partnering with a ministry by the name of Vision of Hope Ministries. Uh, on July 11th, uh, their uh, president was assassinated. No, actually on July 7th, their president was assassinated, uh, spinning that country into further turmoil. You see on the news, you see who is currently the president, you see who is functionally vying for power, and as our good friend Jeff Jocks is constantly reminding me, it's way more complicated than it even seems. Uh, we have been in contact with our ministry contacts in uh, Haiti, particularly in the city of Capetian, through the leadership of our church member Greg Schenke. Uh, once again, God has been gracious and has spared the Christians and the citizens of Capetian from a lot of the turmoil happening in the Haiti of Port of, uh, capital of Haiti, uh, Port-au-Prince, uh, but they still covet our prayers, praying for revival and praying that the church of Jesus Christ would shine uh, brightly and boldly in this moment. But I also want to give you an update on what God is doing in spite of all of the upheaval in both Cuba and Haiti because it's quite remarkable. It was in 2014 that once again through the leadership of Jerry and Donna Perez we were connected with Pastor Ramon and his wife Kenya. Since then in 2014 we have seen God plant three gospel center churches in communist Cuba. These are churches that are boldly preaching the gospel, teaching people what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Through our three church plants, we have been able to do multiple conferences on grace uh, with the pastors there in uh, Cuba. And just most recently, now that the three church plants in Cuba are stable and growing, our pastor, Pastor Ramon, has been relocated to Havana, the capital of Cuba, where he is leading one of the largest seminaries in that nation. And we continue to support not only our church plants, but continue to support Pastor Ramon and his wife, Kenya, as they are leading hundreds and hundreds of pastors in Cuba. Think of the influence and the impact that we have as a church in that nation to raise up pastors, ministers of the gospel, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And so Pastor Ramon once again extends his gratitude uh, to you, Cole Ridge, for your financial support, for your prayers, for advancing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven in Cuba. In Haiti, as I mentioned, our ministry partner, uh, through Greg Schenke, our faithful member, our ministry that we support is Vision of Hope Ministries, located in Capetian. Not only does Vision of Hope Ministries in, uh, include a gospel-centered church, but also a school which has a membership of a thousand students. We have the imp opportunity to impact a thousand students in Haiti every single day. Most recently, uh, through the kind donations of this church, we have sent a bus. As I said to the early service, I'm not sure how that works, getting a bus down to Haiti, but we got a bus down to Haiti for the school. We have supplied school supplies for every single student for the upcoming school year. And we most recently, through the Love Serves Outreach Campaign, put a brand new roof on the school, partnering with Vision of Hope and Ministries. So I want to thank you 
the people, the congregation of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, because this would not be possible without your support. I would ask you that you would continue to pray for our ministries in Cuba and Haiti. You would continue to give and to give faithfully and believe it that God can actually use us to use his people to advance the kingdom in a very dark region of our world, that the light of Jesus Christ would shine brightly. As we continue in our worship and we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord through various means that we provided in our church, I pray that you would take this time as the choir sings over us, that you would be reminded of our rock-solid hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ.
be seated. This morning, I want to talk about the unshakable life, the unshakable life that is only possible for those that have built their life upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. We continue our series through the book of Hebrews as we look at Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. Is it possible, with all of the realities of life, and when our lives are shaken, is it possible that in a world that is constantly in flux, to actually have an unshakable life? There's many themes that we've heard about in Hebrews, but I pray that you are recognizing that the one constant theme is the theme of holding fast, written Originally a sermon, but written as an epistle to Jewish Christians facing persecution, facing sufferings, facing the temptation to turn away from this Christ. They are being reminded over and over again, hold fast, do not let go, do not walk away, because Christ is better. Christ is greater. Over and over again, we see that theme, that there is an anchor in this, un, in this shakeable, uncertain life. In verses 18 through 29 this morning, some scholars have called this the tale of two mountains. For it is the two mountains that is one of the many themes throughout the Bible. And you'll see two mountains starkly contrasted to one another. And for the sake of this sermon, I would like to refer to mountain one as the mountain of self-confidence, while mountain two is the mountain of Christ-centered confidence. You'll see this theme often throughout the Bible, not only the tale of two mountains, but the tale of two cities, the tale of two kingdoms from genera- Gen- Genesis to Revelation. You'll see the comparing and contrasting the city of God to the city of man, the kingdom of God to the kingdom of this world. In fact, I'd like to recommend to you a book called The City of God and the Goal of Creation by T. Desmond Alexander, who does a masterful job, published by Crossway, of explaining one of these many themes throughout the scriptures. But let's look together at this tale of two mountains and how we can be grounded in this unshakable life, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I will tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel, than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised Yet once more I will shake not only the earth but the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And the grass withers And the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. The late night comic and television host, David Letterman, upon his retirement, said this. Every night you're trying to prove 
your self-worth. It's like meeting your girlfriend's family for the first time. You want to be the absolute best, wittiest, smartest, most charming, best-smelling version of yourself. If I can make people enjoy the experience and have a higher regard for me when I'm finished, it makes me feel like an entire person. But if I've come short of that, I'm not happy. In fact, I'm devastated. How things go for me every night is how I feel about myself for the next 24 hours. Because I'm not playing a character. I'm trying to give you the best version of myself. What an incredibly heavy burden to carry. But I want to ask you in light of that illustration, for you, where is your confidence this morning? Is it in your self performance? Is it in your human approval? Is it in how you perform before others and giving this world the best version of you? Or is it truly in the Christ who has performed perfectly on your behalf? I want to ask you this question, which mountain truly defines your life? The mountain of self-confidence or the mountain of Christ-centered confidence. Which mountain are you running to in order to find the security, stability, and hope that your soul ultimately longs for? I first want us to look at that first mountain. This is the shakable life. The shakable life as it's described by the author of Hebrews in verses 18 through 22. This mountain of self-confidence is actually a literal mountain. He's describing the experience of the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Verses 18 through 21 is taking us back to Exodus chapter 19, where the people of God, under the leadership of Moses, prepared themselves for three days, and they came to the Mount Sinai to receive the law. But what he's describing here is what they encountered, and the author of Hebrews uses seven words or phrases to describe this experience. And it's nothing but gloom and fear and trembling and ultimately rejection. You see, it's important for us to understand in verses 18 and 22, this idea of coming to a mountain is not describing a move from one geographical position to another geographical position. The idea of coming to the mountain, as they did in Exodus 19, is our approach to life and God. Not a geographical move from one location to the next, but how we approach life and God. And so the author of Hebrews is saying in verse 18, you Christians, we have not approached life and God as if we are going to Mount Sinai in order to achieve on our own what only God can achieve for us. What he's saying in verse 18 is so profound. He's saying you are acting at times as if you approach life and God with a self-righteousness and a self-confidence, a cavalier flippant attitude as if you can achieve this on your own. And he said, no, quite the contrary. You've approached the other mountain that we'll get to in a second in verse 22. You approach life and God in a whole different way than those that operate with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness. Because he's warning us in verse 18 through 21, those that approach life with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness in their performance... You will be shaken. The word shaken here is synonymous with judgment. You see, the only thing Mount Sinai has to offer without a mediator, the only thing Mount Sinai, that first mountain, has to offer without Jesus Christ is judgment. You see, if we approach God and life as if we don't need him, as if we can do this on our own, with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness, you will only be disappointed. In fact, it says you'll be devastated. You see, the reason why this can only result in fear, as it says in verses 18 through 21, is that Mount Sinai tells you you will never measure up. 
you will never be good enough. Because at Mount Sinai, Moses and the people of God were confronted with the absolute righteousness and holiness of God in light of their unrighteousness and their imperfection. And so if you dare try to approach this life apart from God, building a life that relies on your own strength and your own power, a life that centers its confidence upon you, you can only expect the same result. A life that when the world is shaken, that you will be shaken by it. If your confidence in your hope is in anything but Jesus Christ, when this world is shaken, you will be shaken by it. And we would do ourselves a so much good and do our children and our grandchildren so much favor and good if we would teach them early on that a life founded and centered around you, a life centered around your own confidence and strength and power will only result in misery. The result of self-confidence is only a life of fear, bitterness, doubt, and defeat because we realize that we'll never be able to ultimately measure up It tells us in verse 19 that there's a word speaking to them. And it says eventually in verse 19, they basically tell the mountain, stop. I can't handle it anymore. Because it is the voice of judgment and condemnation. That is the only word that is given to those that think that they can live this life apart from God. And live a life centered around their confidence, their strength, and their power, you will ultimately be confronted with the sobering reality of the judgment and condemnation of God. If you try to live your life apart from him, it is a life that is shakable, living your life before the mountain of self-confidence. But thanks be to God that the author of Hebrews does not only give us a sobering picture of what the shakable life looks like, a life built on your own confidence and strength, but moving on in verses 22, he gives us what it looks like to approach life and God in such a way that results in an unshakable life. That regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what life throws your way, regardless of what you experience in life, you can live with the absolute promise that your life will be unshakable. And this mountain in verse 22 is the mountain of Zion. Now the mountain of Zion was the highest place outside of Jerusalem. Eventually it encompassed what is known as the Temple Mount. But throughout scripture, it is also symbolic of the heavenly city. It is symbolic of the heavenly city that awaits all those that have been saved in Jesus Christ. The heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, the spiritual Mount Zion. And that's what the author of Hebrews is referring to here. He's taking us to the end of history and he's saying this is the city we seek. Not a city built by man not a city grounded by man's confidence and centered upon his confidence, but we seek and go to a city that is centered and founded on God, centered on the confidence of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. But do you notice what he says in verse 22 that is absolutely profound? He says in verse 22, yes, you haven't come to the first mountain, The mountain that can only result in fear. But he says in the past tense. Did you catch that? In verse 22. He says you have come. Wait a second. I thought pastor you just told us Mount Zion is the heavenly city that awaits those at the end of history. At the consummation of the kingdom. But the author of Hebrews says you've already come past tense. And that's the glorious truth for the Christian. The glorious truth for the Christian is that we have the privilege to already experience, not in perfection, but to genuinely experience the blessings of the heavenly city right now. That's the living in the already but not yet. That's what it means to not live of this world, but simply live in this world, that our citizenship is ultimately in heaven. The author of Hebrews is saying, stop living as those that have not already experienced 
heavenly Zion. You are citizens of a different city. You are citizens of a kingdom that does not find their confidence in man, but finds their confidence in Christ. Start acting like it. You can experience heaven now and manifest it with other believers. The city of God right here and now. This is what it means to be a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is what it means to have an unshakable life. This is what it means to approach God and life not as if we are trying to climb up the mountain all by ourselves. But we've already come to a mountain where God climbs down the mountain for us and offers us him himself. It says the very living presence of God and the living city of God. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are the people that are seeking the city that is to come. Do you understand the implications of this? The application for this as the people of God living in a shakable world, a world and a life of uncertainty? It means you have a secured future. You already can live out your future now. The author of Hebrews is telling us you don't have to worry about the future because in Jesus Christ you can experience a foretaste of heaven on earth. You know what we fear the most? We fear tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so many of us right now are full of fear and anxiety not knowing what will my health look like tomorrow? What will my life look like tomorrow? What will my finances look like tomorrow? Will I be relevant? Will I go the distance? Will I make it? And the author of Hebrews says, stop. You already know the future. Your greatest fear in life and death, your future is forever secured and you can live out the realities now. What a beautiful promise an application for the people of God. But not only do you have a secured future, but you have unspeakable joy. Look what it says for those that have already come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. In verse 22, and you've come into the presence of innumerable angels in the festal gathering. That phrase festal gathering was only reserved for a gathering, a, a gathering where the celebration was euphoric. It was actually reserved for the, the Olympic gatherings in Athens. When the, when the peoples from all over the region would gather, they would throw this incredible party, this incredible celebration. And the author of Hebrews is saying, this is what it's going to be like. And thank God. Sometimes we give the impression as the church and as the people of God, like heaven is going to be boring. And the author of Hebrews says, it's going to be a wild party beyond your imagination. The only word he can come up with is a festal gathering in a joyless world. You can have unspeakable joy, not at the end, but the author of Hebrews says you can have unspeakable joy now. This is the unshakable life. You see, the problem is we spend all of our time and energy and money seeking after the things that can only be promised at Mount Zion. And we will do everything possible by our own confidence and according to our own strength and power to secure our future and to cure, secure our stability and to secure our lives and to secure our joy to no avail. And the author of Hebrews says that all the things you long for, all the things your soul craves, only found for those that seek the city, the unshakable life. This is the gospel. This is the good news for you. You know what's remarkable at this passage? In the midst of all of this joy and all this festal gathering, it says in verse 23, that sitting on the mountain, the mountain of Zion, the, the mountain that's full of joy, it says the judge is there. I don't know about you, I don't want a judge there. Everything I know about the judge, is, the judge ruins the party, right? The judge is there to condemn, the, the judge is there to, 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 to judge me. How can the judge be in the midst of the party? 
That's the good news. You see, for those that know Jesus Christ, for those that have been saved by his grace, the judge becomes a father. Because in the person of Jesus Christ, on the cross, he took on our condemnation. He took on the very judgment and the wrath of God. And it is only found in Christianity, this truth, that the judge came down to be judged so that you and I could forever live with the glorious truth that we are set apart by grace according to his glory and for his glory forever. The judge in Jesus becomes your father only in Christianity and only the gospel of Jesus Christ gives you that hope. You know, in verse 25, there's a rather sobering warning it says, see to that, you don't refuse. You don't refuse the one who is speaking. Remember I said in this passage, there's two voices. There's a voice we're told in verse 19 coming off the Mount Sinai. That voice was only able to be a voice of condemnation and judgment. But there's another voice we're told in verse 24. It's the voice coming from Mount Zion that does not offer a word of condemnation and judgment, but instead it actually speaks a better word. It is the words of the blood of Jesus, a blood that speaks a better word even than Abel. Remember, Abel in Genesis was only able to speak a word of vengeance, but the blood of Jesus says, I've taken the vengeance of God. So that you could forever have the word of grace spoken upon your life. But the author of Hebrews says, don't mess around with this. Do not refuse this word. It is a far better word. And who in the world would refuse this word that's coming from Mount Zion? And so if you are here this morning or listening in at home, would you heed the words and the exhortation from the author of Hebrews. Do not refuse this word because there you cannot get this word in anything else and from anywhere else and from no one else except for Jesus Christ that is the word that is spoken to you this morning. To come, to come to the mountain, the mountain of Mount Zion and experience the grace of the judge who came down to be judged for you, do not reject the eloquent word of the blood of Jesus. How can you refuse such a great salvation? My eight-year-old daughter, Lydia, loves to dance. She often turns walking into dancing. If you've ever seen her here at the church or you've been to our home, I mean, we could be in the national park and she will just be dancing right along through the park. But any time she dances, she demands an audience. It's a big ordeal. And she's quite a good dancer. I mean, she gets her dancing moves after her father, of course. <laughs> and as she's dancing and demands an audience, it could be in the middle of the day, it could be at night, it doesn't matter what the time, it doesn't matter what we're doing. I could be working on a sermon, we could be working on the house, everybody needs to stop and watch Lydia dance. But the look on her face when we stop and we pause and we give her the t attention and the favor, the look on her face and the joy that is expressed it's only something a father and a mother could truly appreciate. Listen to me. If you are in Christ this morning, you no longer have to jump up and down. You no longer have to fight for the approval of this world. You no longer have to approach life and God based on your performance and your confidence, jumping up and down, waving all around in order to get the affection and the approval that you already have in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus this morning, you've already come. Rest in that glorious truth. 
If you know Jesus Christ and have been saved by his grace, live as if you already have and are experiencing the affection and favor of your Father. But if you haven't come, would you come? No longer have to fight. No longer having to strive. No longer having to say that my life will be built upon my confidence and my strength and my performance. But I can accept the one who performed for me, who changes my life forever. It allows me to say, as the author of Hebrews said, how can we reject such a great salvation and instead respond with joy and awe and reverence to this God? who came down for me in the midst of an uncertain life and a shakable world. We can be the people of God who can say, I've already come, already come to Mount Zion and my life, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation, I can say that my life is unshakable. Don't run back to that mountain that can only offer condemnation but continue to run to the mountain, the mountain of joy, the mountain who turns the judge into your father. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray right now there are people here and people more than likely at home, people that will one day maybe listening to this service that have built their entire life upon the, the confidence of themselves, their own strength, their own performance. And I pray that for the first time, they would wake up and see that a life built upon themselves, a life of self-confidence can only lead to fear, can only lead to bitterness, and ultimately lead to destruction. Lord, I thank you that you have created a way made a way for us to be saved from ourselves and for the, uh, from the eternal torment that we are told will happen one day. For one day, the same God that shook earth at the cross and judged Jesus on our behalf, that same God has promised by his word that he will again shake the heavens and the earth on that final day. And only those that are connected to Jesus by faith alone will not be shaken, but saved forever to experience the joy and a glorious future, life to the full, the way it was meant to be lived. So Lord, would those people cry out to you, cry out for mercy and grace forgiveness of sins, saying, Jesus, I believe who you say you are. I believe that you have come to do the impossible for me. Jesus, you are the only one that can allow me to climb that holy hill, that you came to be judged so that I would never experience the condemnation of the judge, but instead experience the favor of the Father. I surrender my life, my heart, to you so that regardless of what happens in this life, regardless of an uncertain tomorrow, my life is forever unshakable because I believe and belong to an unshakable kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray to that prayer and pray to receive Jesus. There will be people in the back, leaders, elders, that would love the opportunity to pray with you and for you. But please do not leave here today without telling someone, today's the day that I became a child of God. Let's close our time with singing that great hymn of the faith, It Is Well.
child of God, it is surely well with your soul. Receive this good word. May it empower you as citizens of the kingdom of heaven this week. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.